Hello everyone. Thanks for joining me for another Tabletop Baseball video. Uh, I'm recording from my wife's craft room here. So uh, yet, a, yet a new location for, for my videos. Um, tonight I am going to provide an introduction to another vintage Tabletop Baseball game called Grand Slam. It was uh, created by uh, the Sming Game Company and it was released in 1980. I honestly don't know if there were more seasons or not, um, but if anybody does know, please comment. And uh, on that subject, uh, comments are always welcome, uh, favorable or unfavorable, um, and likes and subscribes are fine as well. Uh, once in a while, I get a thumbs down on my video, and I'm not sure I ever know why. Um, but if, if that's you, that's fine. Uh, but I think it would be useful um, to hear comments, uh, positive and or negative. Uh, thanks for uh, those of you who have given me direct feedback as well. Um, it's good to know that, um, you know, I have a target audience for these videos. Uh, just when I think I'm going to run out of topics, I uh, come up with another one. I have at least one more in the backlog, and maybe I'll get more inspiration as time goes on. Anyway, Grand Slam. So uh, before I talk about Grand Slam, I wanted to mention um, you know, where you can get it. And so uh, a friend and I have created this uh, Facebook group uh, currently named Astra Batter Up Baseball Game. Um, and um, I, I make, make mention of that because, first of all, uh, everything you would need to play Grand Slam except for four D6 dice can be found uh, in the files section of this group. Uh, the second thing I wanted to mention is it's possible we may rename this group because it started out as a batter up group, but now it has Grand Slam. It's going to have another vintage game called uh, Pennant Drive in it and maybe some, some other games as well. Um, another video that you may want to watch in connection with this one I did on uh, uh, dice and precision in tabletop sims. And you can find that on my uh, channel, which uh, you can see down below at Steve Etzel, or Steve underscore Etzel actually. And I'm on the Delphi forum. You maybe see me there and you can always send me a direct email. So, with that as background, I'm going to talk about Grand Slam first in context of some similar games. And you can find videos um, on these games in my, in my channel. But the one at the top is the classic uh, Sports Illustrated game from the early 1970s. And uh, in that game, you would roll the dice against the pitcher chart first. In a few cases, these color, colored boxes would indicate the result would occur on the pitcher chart. But for most of these green boxes, you would actually go over and roll again against the batter chart and get the final result. Um, that kind of gave rise to another game, which kind of is a combination of SI and uh, APA, which is called Batter Up, as I just mentioned uh, a few minutes ago. And the same thing happened. You rolled the dice against the pitcher card. If the result is listed there, you would look it up on the, the result boards. And if it was a blank, you would go over to the pitcher, I'm sorry, the batter card and roll again and get the result. So um, very similar uh, engines, if you will. Uh, and we'll come back to those two in a minute. So how does Grand Slam work? Well, in many ways, Grand Slam works the same. So um, you start by rolling four dice and uh, you read the pitcher card and um, you would either get a result or you might get a result that causes you to roll uh, the dice again and read off of a second column very much like an APA card, uh, 
if you're familiar with that. Um, otherwise, you'll get an X result, which says go over to the batter card and roll again. So very much the same model as we saw here. And I just knocked over my wife's light, but fortunately it did not break. So, um, and then there, there was an unusual O result as well. So one or two dice rolls to, to resolve the, 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 the play. Now, whether you get the result directly off the pitcher card or off the batter card, then you go over to what's called an index chart, which would be somewhat similar to the result boards you would have in APA. Um, and then you would read a number there and you go to a second result chart and get the final result. And I'll show you what I mean here, but the index chart has 46 rows uh, and um, 24 columns. You say, well, why, why 24 columns? Well, the index chart has the eight on but base situations across the top, but then further than that, it has the out situations. So there's really 24, I guess, states, if you will. Um, so when you re read the result number off the card, you find which of the row, rows is applicable and the, the on base situation and the out situation. And um, from that, you'll read a number and then you take that number and go to a second chart uh, and, and uh, finally resolve everything. Now there are 96 individual or unique play results on this chart. Um, in some respects, there's really not that many. Um, I mean, there's multiple kinds of doubles. Um, there's, I don't know, five or seven or eight uh, pass ball types. And the reason why they're different is uh, it depends on the pass ball rating. Um, so I don't know if there was an easier way to implement that or not. Um, you know, there's multiple types of pop outs and, and, and who it goes to, uh, things like that. Um, and then various types over here, as you can see, various types of double plays where, um, uh, it talks about who the ball goes to and, you know, what happens, uh, to the base runners, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, you know, I had, I've actually not played, uh, Grand Slam. So, you know, I can't really tell you of having two separate play result charts uh, is cumbersome or not. There's one, only one little thing that I kind of find annoying, and that is um, if you roll a 10, let's say, on either the pitcher or the batter card, that takes you to 14 on this chart, which is a walk. And maybe it really doesn't matter, but wouldn't it have just been as easy to put those 14s on row 14? And it, it would just be, I think, less confusing. Because, um, you know, you tend to memorize these charts and, um, you know, now you have to remember that a 10 is a 14 and a 14 is a walk. So I'm not going to belabor that point, but uh, just kind of an interesting choice. I will say this is, I guess on the surface, a sophisticated way of producing the various results by having these extensive uh, tables uh, governed by uh, not only the on-base situation, but the number of outs and, um, and varying, potentially varying the results 
accordingly. Now, all that said, there are certain results that, that seem to be pretty common, you know, all the way across. So 18 and 19 is either a 22 or a 23. 22 or 23 is just different types of follow-ups. So again, not to belabor the point. So um, just to finish this flow chart here at the bottom, um, there is a also a possibility after you've read the index chart and the play result chart, if you get a 20 on the play result chart, you're gonna go to uh, the what's called the range chart and there will be a potentially a single or an out and then possibly some rare plays there. And if it's a result number 19, you'll go uh, to the error chart and uh, you may get outs or errors or hits and, and, and they vary by runner on base situation. I'm not gonna talk about that today. This is definitely not a demo um, or even, even a tutorial, but that's the general structure of the game. Okay, uh, I'd like to spend some time on the player cards. So this is directly from the, the rules or the instructions. And the player cards obviously have a, a pitching card, as I said, and a batter card. Um, you have all, all kinds of interesting ratings, which I'm actually going to talk about on, on a, the next slide. But, um, you know, there's, uh, as you can see, the dual columns I talked about. So um, if, if there's an X, let's say you rolled a four on the uh, pitcher card, you would go over to the batter card and uh, finish, finish the result. And as I said before, if you roll an N, then you roll again and go to column two. And we'll talk about why, why they would have two columns on these cards. Um, pretty standard stuff, injury ratings, um, some pretty complex fielding ratings, uh, a bunting rating uh, for the pitcher, um, and the batter. And then uh, the batter also has uh, a base running speed separate from the stolen base rating. And then we're, and then they have a inclination number, which often is known as a jump rating or, or a, a lead rating in Stratomatic. I actually did a whole separate video uh, in the last day or so about uh, jump ratings. So um, if you want to learn more about that, uh, check out that video. Um, and then the, the other thing we'll talk about in a second, but both the pitcher and the batter have what they call a home run rating. And that's separate, separate but complementary to whatever home run chances might, might exist on the, the, the card itself. So um, maybe... Maybe without further ado, I'm not sure. Oh, I didn't intend to have two of the same slide. Makes me concerned that I forgot something here. But um, maybe before we do that, you can kind of see in the background here uh, what the actual cards look like. They're actually very colorful. Um, these happen to be the 1979 Pirates. And... Um, the other interesting thing about these cards, since I have these pinned here to my wife's um, thing here, is here, you can see it here, Kent DeCalvey, he has a pitching card, which is kind of just out of view. But they also had customized or individualized pitcher batting cards. So Kent DeCalvey batted 133, 15 at bats, um, essentially no hits. Um, of course, he was a, just a closer, so he wouldn't have many at-bats. But it's it's true that, that they had... Um, here's a good example. Enrique Rowan, maybe not another good example. Bur Burp Lila, he's a starter. He had 70 at-bats, one double, um, probably some singles because he hit 129. But this is, this is a batter card, and he has a separate... Uh, card. 
So um, with that, let's talk about the various ratings that, that we just saw on those cards. And you may want to pause this and study it now or if you if you actually want to use the, the game, but Grand Slam has a lot of features here. It, it kind of has a little bit of a complex design, but I think you gain uh, some sophistication out of that complexity. So as we said, there's, there's running speed and um, there's four levels of running speed. Uh, of course, it's not like Strat that go from eight to 17 and, and, and all that. Does it need to be any more than four? I don't know. I just did a video on a game called Pennant Drive. They had four. They had slow, average, fast, and very fast. So uh, that probably works. Uh, there's an outfield arm rating, so a throwing arm rating, and there are four different ones. Again, that's probably enough. Uh, base stealing, we mentioned. The ratings actually go from A to Z, theoretically. Uh, I don't think they really uh, go all the way from A to Z. I looked up uh, 1979. looks like Willie Wilson had 83 stolen bases, and uh, he has uh, the best rating of an E. Uh, they would save the Z for people like, let's say, Willie Stargell, who never ran. Um, but uh, that's pretty impressive. I've never seen that many base stealing ratings. Um, this jump that I that I alluded to, there are six jump ratings. I explained this in more detail in the other other video, but you just roll a D6. Uh, if the person has a six jump rating, like a Ricky Henderson, he's he doesn't need to roll. He, he just can go. But uh, you roll the D6. If the number um, that is rolled is equal to or less than the player's jump rating, then um, then he can he can attempt to steal. Uh, Interestingly, that the jump rating, if you roll a one, that's that's still a one sixth chance of of getting getting the lead, which maybe is kind of high. I don't know, maybe not. Um, Sixteen percent, seventeen percent. Um, catcher arm ratings, uh, quite sophisticated. Uh, they work just like they do in many other games. They can increase or decrease the likelihood of. Uh, of successful stealing. So there's six of those ratings. There's five pitcher move to first ratings, uh, sometimes called hold ratings. There are four bunting ratings, not unlike strat. And then uh, the error ratings, quite a bit of uh, M would be 13 different, yeah, 13 different uh, error ratings. Uh, the range of ratings vary, varies by position. Uh, that's a lot of different error ratings. Uh, they had a separate range rating that applies to everybody but catchers, A, a B, or C. And they actually then had a separate double play rating that applied to infielders and pitchers. So they they put a lot of thought into the, the defense, if you will. Whether it plays well or not, um, you're going to have to wait for another video. Uh, maybe from me or maybe from our friend uh, Kurt Berglund at some point. Um I indicated that catchers have passed ball ratings and they have uh, 19 different potential passed ball ratings. Probably uh, could get away with maybe two or three, but eh, so be it. Uh, and then, as I mentioned before, there's a batter home run rating and a pitcher home, running, right, home run rating. And it's really an indication of whether um, the um, batter, for example... It is a normal home run hitter or a light hitter, low home run hitter. And I would compare this very much to the uh, Stratomatic ratings where I think the batter can have a normal rating or, or a weak rating. And then uh, the pitcher equivalent of that is, um, is a separate rating on the pitcher card. I, I'm a big believer in home run ratings like this to calibrate home runs. I think it helps a lot in getting uh, accuracy in the sim, particularly for pitchers. And um, 
So, you know, I think they did an interesting job with that here. Okay, uh, just to keep this moving, um, let's talk about kind of the design of the game. Grand Slam uses four D6 dice. Uh, you can see the uh, cop picture of the actual dice on the right. Um, you roll them, you add them up, and uh, you get a number from anywhere from 4 to 24, which kind of makes sense. You could get four ones, that would be a 4. You could get four sixes, that would be 24. I have a separate video on dice and precision in Sims. I am actually not a fan of using four dice and adding them up like this. Um, and the, the bar, bar graphs here explain why. Um, you can get some very refined results here. We'll talk about this in a minute at the very ends of the distribution. So if you know if you want to really refine pass ball chances or hit batsman chances, this is great. The, the contrast to that is uh, dice roll 14, I think, is the most common with four dice. Uh, a lot of these results here in the middle uh, are very uh, high percentage of the total. And a lot of times, I think you would want a, a flatter distribution so you could carve up uh, the results uh, accordingly without going into it and without duplicating that uh, other dice video. The, the, the way they get around it um, in Grand Slam just like APA, is they have a second column of numbers. And so occasionally, when you roll on the first column, you'll be sent over to the second column, and that allows uh, the results to be carved up um, a little bit better. So not to belabor that point, but, um, you know, I don't, I don't think uh, it was really necessary to use 4D6. First of all, I think the precision's enough with 3 or 3D10s or whatever. And then kind of the summation is not, in my mind, the best, best way to do it. So as with any of these vintage Sims, um, the first thing that often comes to my mind is, could I reverse engineer that? And could I make my own cards for the Sim? And so I kind of looked at, at Grand Slam with that in mind. And I've already shown you, as it relates to these... Um, these charts here um, and the dual columns here on the cards that there's a fair amount of complexity here. Um, so I would probably characterize it as about an order of magnitude more complex than batter up, which I did reverse engineer. But, you know, the, you know, I thought, well, it may be possible if I can understand just generally how the pitcher and batter cards are constructed. Um, I was able to do batter up because it was more or less the same underlying engine as Sports Illustrated with one exception. Um, what I found here is, is it's different and I'm gonna show you how it's different. So um, I took two of the cards from the 1979 Pirates that you have back here. Um, and here's Jim Rooker. And so what I did is, uh, first of all, I listed out all the dice rolls and how many chances there are. And there's uh, 1,296 different unique chances, I guess you, you would say, which is what you get when you multiply 6 times 6 times 6 times 6. And then I convert them to a percentage probability. And like I was saying, uh, 13, 14, and 15 are all right around 11% each. But then you get down to the fringes here, and a 1 or a 24 is only 0.1%. Um, then what I did is I took Jim Rooker's card, and I typed in all his column 1 results and his column 2 results, and I interpreted them, which meant I had to keep referring to um, these two charts. And, you know, I, I used a an abbreviation, and then I built these tables over here to uh, summarize uh, the chances. So, uh, for example, um, dice roll four 
on column one is a strikeout and and I'm sorry, dice roll five, which has four chances. And so I had some logic over here that, that tallies the four chances. I did that with the entirety of column one, and then I went over and did column two because Rooker has one dice roll, number 18, where it refers you over to column two and roll again. That's only applies for 80 chances out of 1,296, but they felt felt the need to carve uh, carve things up a, a little bit more detail. Um, this was time consuming. Now, if I was gonna do more, which I may or may not, I'm trying to resist the temptation, I, I have another way to do it, which would be uh, significantly more automated, but uh, so be it. This, so, so it is. So here's Rooker. So um, what I've done is I've drawn a pie chart of all the total breakdown of 1,296 results. And what you see here is that the, the largest one is that you pass, pass this along to the batter. And it's a little less than half the time. Um, there's also a huge slice, probably almost about the same size, where there's some kind of an out that is not a strikeout. Um, and then I think there's about an 8% slice here that um, has you go, go check the range chart or the error chart. And then there's a very small slice for strikeouts, an even smaller slice for uh, home runs, no other hits, a little slice for walks, uh, which I find interesting, and then another little slice for a possible wild pitch or balk or pass ball. Um, so you really, compared to um, Sports Illustrated and even, even Batter Up, uh, you've got um, a, a different structure, and if you'll bear with me just a second, you can kind of see it here. Um, each of these rows is a pitcher, and the way, the way Sports Illustrated work is kind of by exception, and if the pitcher uh, had above average or better than average batting average against, he would get outs on his chart, which um, kind of like, uh, that's what these red and blue things are, or if he um, gave up more a higher batting average than the league average, he would have actually potentially a single on his chart. And you can't see it here, but a couple of these pitchers in the middle have hit. So kind of on an exception basis, the pitcher would have some hits or outs, but most of the action took place over here on the, on the batter card. And uh, this batter up game worked almost identically with the exception of every pitcher card essentially had a certain number of hits on it. And then as a result, there were a certain number of outs on it uh, to compensate to get the batting average right. But these two are kind of, kind of similar to each other. Um, what you see here on Rooker's chart is other than a small slice for home runs, which is... Um, I think there's light blue here. There are no hits on the pitcher card. Okay, so I looked at a batter card and did the same type of analysis. Well, it wasn't quite as complex, um, but you had the same thing where uh, dice roll 21, which 20 chances, uh, sent you over to column two. So they that 1.5%, they felt the need to carve it up into into smaller, uh, smaller things, smaller uh, um, results. And quite frankly, what it allowed them to do is get about one chance assigned to the hit batsman. But um, they probably could have done that a different way. But again, I don't fully understand. Um, so let's look at the pie chart before we really start. Um, so I did the same analysis uh, as we were just talking about, 
And what you see on here is um, he has on his chart, he has a singles, a pretty, pretty good allocation to singles, pretty good allocation to doubles, decent allocation to home runs. He had 32 that year, I believe. Uh, decent allocation to walks. And then, of course, he was known as a power hitter to strike out a fair amount. So, um, you know, you see the strikeouts there on the left. Uh, we mentioned the very small allocation to hit batsmen, about 1% of the time that, that you get to the, the batter chart here. Uh, he would get a hits batsman. Um, and then there's just some other general types of outs besides strikeouts. Um, just, it, this makes sense, but, you know, I did the math and unlike uh, Sports Illustrated or, or Batter Up, where the batter chart kind of ties to his actual stats, here, because you had uh, a whole bunch of outs, essentially almost no hits on the pitcher chart, you have here a lot of hits on, on the, uh, the batter chart. And if you take out walks, it's actually 55.5% of the chances on once you get the Stargell's card are hits. So uh, essentially it's a 555 implied batting average on this chart. So uh, what's the point of all this? The, the, kind of the point of all this is I do not understand the logic for how they designed what goes on the pitcher, pitcher card and what goes on the batter card. And sitting here today, I have no expectation and minimal desire to try to reverse engineer this game, even though I think it's a very cool game with a lot of sophisticated features. I don't know if I could reverse engineer it, and my current belief is I cannot. Um, I think if I worked at it for a while longer, I might come up with some simplified way of reverse engineering it. Um, I happen to be reading a book about the history of uh, cryptology, I think it's called, or codes and ciphers. And I'm reading right now about how Alan Turing uh, was able uh, with a team to uh, decode the, the Enigma ciphers uh, and help, help win World War II. Uh, I don't know if this is that complex, but... You know, Anna, as I'm reading that book, I can I can see how um, it would take a lot of work to reverse engineer this game, which is which is kind of unfortunate in a, in a way. Who knows? Maybe some other enterprising individual will take it take it up, or maybe um, maybe I will at some point. Um, as I said in one of my reverse engineering videos, it takes uh, kind of uh, experience and knowledge and analysis but maybe more so it takes persistence and then you got to sprinkle in a little bit of uh, we'll call it divine inspiration i think uh, to get to that point so again all i don't know if you made it this far but if you did thank you um i just want to wanted to do this video really to uh, introduce grand slam encourage you to give it a try i think it's uh, a pretty cool game in terms of what they tried to do, um, and uh, I think it remains to be seen uh, uh, what you know what the conclusion is on how they did it. So thanks again for for listening, and and again if you made it this far, uh, double thanks. Take care. Bye.